Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good midnight, regardless of where you are in the world. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for another uh, session in our strate strategy distinctiveness dialogues. Uh, my name is Matka Moen. On behalf of the STR Executive Committee and Leadership, I welcome you all again to this session and very, very much appreciate your continued interest in uh, this series and many other events that the Strategic Management Division has organized. Uh, uh, today, uh, we're pleased to be joined by Professor Marcus Larson, Professor Xavier Martin, Professor Ron Mundabi, Professor Susan Perkins, and Professor Mignon Zha, who are experts and thought leaders in the area of international business with a focus on strategic management research as well. So we're going to have another interdisciplinary dialogue to try to build bridges across these two fields that have had a, a mutual interest, mutual research interest across members of uh, SDR division as well. So without further ado, I'll we'll start the session. Uh, Professor Larson, Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, a little depending on where you are in the world. So let me uh, see if I can share my slides here. Um, right, so do you see my slides now? Yeah. All right. So, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you, Marco, uh, for for uh, organizing this this panel. I think uh, it's, it's a wonderful initiative, and uh, of course, I'm I'm extremely pleased to uh, be invited to uh, contribute to uh, this exciting debate amongst sort of esteemed colleagues as well. So I'm, I'm truly honored. Uh, what I'm going to do over the next ten minutes or so uh, is to uh, ponder a little bit upon this this question that you see on the uh, slide here. So, how uh, and perhaps if so, IB and uh, strategic management can be considered as distinct fields of research. And cl clearly, this is a rather big question, and I have no intention of of answering this uh, sort of. Uh, uh, holds only, but, but 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 I'll try to approach it a little bit by drawing on or sort of pondering how a specific international business topic can, and if so, whether it can be distinguished from the uh, logics of strategic management. And uh, sort of a short disclaimer in this respect is that I will uh, draw on two of my own papers to substantiate my arguments. Uh, and I also acknowledge that this comes with a certain risk that my reasoning may be a little bit biased towards how I think about these issues here. So I also very much look forward to the uh, debates afterwards. Right. So uh, first of all, uh, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about a paper that that Carolina Witte from RSM, and I think I saw Carolina in the uh, room here uh, as well, that we published in Organization Science last year. Uh, and, and the question that we ask in this paper is whether firms with something that we call an informal legacy are more likely to start exporting, right? So, so this is a paper that falls within the field of international business. We talk about sort of the decision to start export and thereby engage in business across uh, national boundaries. And the way that we build up the arguments in this paper is to first emphasize that exporting can be seen as a strategy, a particularly attractive strategy for firms, well, I guess all around, but also in, in, in particular for firms based in developing economies. Right? So exporting can provide, for example, access to external knowledge. It can provide access to in, innovation and learning. It can overcome domestic liabilities and so forth. So many firms strive to start exporting when they are based in regions that may have certain, for example, institutional flaws in their home countries. So what we then try to understand is whether firms that have, as I said, this thing called an informal legacy are more or less likely to start exporting after becoming formal sort of registered firms. And then the way that we try to build this argument is to say that upon firm foundation, entrepreneurs may choose to either comply with regulations and register their firms so that you are a formally operating firm from the very inception, 
or you may operate for a certain period of time as an unregistered, not paying your taxes, not having the paperwork, and thereby becoming an illegal entity, and hence belonging to what has been called this the informal economy, which comprise of a very dominant part of, of, uh, of, of, of the economy in, in especially the global south. And then what we try to ask is whether sort of either of these two options will increase the likelihood that firms make the decision to start exporting later on in the uh, life cycle of, of these firms. The argument that we provide then is to say that operating informally, so thereby sort of being in the informal economy, operating illegally, provide firms with a certain advantage compared to those firms that comply with regulations of low cost and flexible exploration in the sense that they can try out different business models, they can try out different products, different ideas before finally finding the golden nugget and thereby sort of going into the market with the intention of selling this. But we also argue that this provides them with a certain domestic legitimacy liability in the sense that they have the status of being illegal. And this may imprint a certain conception that they are not necessarily as good as other firms. And these two effects, we then argue, reduce both exporting barriers in the sense that they have had the chance to explore more freely, but it also incentivizes exporting as an exit strategy as a way to overcome this domestic legitimacy liability. Uh, and then what we find uh, is, is, is uh, well, support for, for the general sort of hypothesis in this paper, namely that starting informally is possibly related to the propensity to initiate exporting after getting the paperwork sort of becoming formal. Uh, and we base this on a sample of some 7,000 firms across a number of different African countries and it's, as I said, conditional on registration. So, so that is the paper, that is the IB example that I will try to speak a little bit upon in terms of trying to ask, would we be able to develop this argument without using the logic from strategic management, right? So we have an IB paper, and then I would like to understand sort of, can we develop this argument without sort of drawing upon what we know from strategic management and thereby try to approximate this question of, are these two fields distinct? And if so, how? And to answer this question, uh, I'm going to present the model that, that uh, Michael Leiblein, Jeff Royer, Torben Pilsen, and I published in the uh, Global Strategy Journal last year, where we asked sort of a rather, I would say, fundamental question of when are global decisions strategic, right? So basically, what we then try to understand is to say, well, a global decision or an international decision, I'm a little bit agnostic to this, this distinction between global and international, but rather sort of a international decision, such as decision to start exporting, how can this be considered a strategic decision? And does this also allow us to build the arguments that we built in this paper to, to basically sort of conclude that they are more likely to start exporting? So we approach this question by then trying to systematize what characterizes global decisions and what characterizes strategic decisions, and then speculate what these two decisions may have in common. And I guess sort of the basic uh, message of the paper is, is summarized in a very simple model that I'm going to present right now. So first of all, we sort of say, well, what, what may characterize a global decision? Right? And sort of without offering an exhaustive list of the characteristics of global decision, we say that, well, global decisions may be defined by decisions that exploit factor differences, right? So larger market shares, market opportunities, uh, uh, resources in other countries that they may exploit. It may be decisions that are characterized by institutional differences. So you try to take advantage of the fact that there are institutional differences across countries. But it can also be different conceptions of distance that, say, the firms want to take advantage of. And to the extent that decisions that are defined by sort of logics such as these and many other logic as well, we then argue that they can be characterized as global decisions. Then on the other side, we are also trying to speculate, well, what may then characterize a strategic decision, right? And in this respect, we're saying that while strategic decisions may be characterized by decisions that are defined by an extent of being interdecisional, interdependent, so the decision that I make now, such as exporting, will have consequence for other decisions in how I run my business. Uh, it can also be defined by decisions that have a high degree of interactor interdependency, so in the sense that decisions that I make will have consequences for other actors within my ecosystem, however defined. 
And then we're also saying that strategic decisions can be defined by decisions that have a high degree of intertemporal interdependency. So decisions that I make now will have consequences for decisions that I will make in the future. So in combination, we're arguing that, that, that decisions that, that are characterized by both being global as well as strategic, well, sort of no surprise, can be characterized as global strategy decisions. And this we then say uh, sort of rules upon the logic of both being global with these factors that you see here, as well as strategic with these facts that you see there. And then, of course, there are decisions that, that, that fall outside these categories, and these can be sort of seen as neither global nor strategic. Right? So the question then is, 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 how does this relate to this paper that I just talked about, about the informal legacy? And I think sort of by using a framework such as this, I think it becomes quite evident that it's very difficult for us to make the reasoning that we're making without drawing upon the logics of both of the fields that I'm talking about here, right? So for example, the global or the international decision to start exporting, clearly this is motivated by factor differences, right? So there may be larger market opportunities abroad, for example. It can also be institutional differences, seeing that exporting can be a way to escape the domestic liabilities, legitimacy liabilities in the home countries. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, what we see is that we are not able to develop this argument without also draw, drawing upon the logics of what strategic decisions are, right? So interdecisional interdependencies. So clearly there are consequences for decisions such as how to market goods. So the decision to export have consequence for sort of how do I market my goods in the foreign market? How do I find the distribution channels? Basically, how do I establish a firm that is apt to succeed with exporting? It can also have consequences for the interactor interdependencies in the sense that starting informally creates sort of a legitimacy liability within the home market, within the home stakeholders. And it's this liability amongst the other actors in the ecosystem that pushes the firm to seek foreign market as this exit strategy. And then finally, also with this intertemporal interdependency, namely that the decision to start informally will have consequences for how you will perceive exporting to be an attractive strategy in the longer run. Right. So sort of try to sort of wrap up what I'm trying to say here. So are IB and strategic management distinct? And if so, how? Uh, I, I, I don't think so, <laughs> I think is my basic conclusion here. So, so I think the intersection of international business and strategic, strategic management, namely global strategy, provides a rich and distinctive and fruitful way to contribute to our understanding of business and general management, right? So, and this also comes with a certain commitment in the sense that the development of theory that is unique to the field of global strategy requires that we understand the attributes of both strategic and global decisions, right? So it's, it's, it's in that sense, somewhat naive to be uh, ignorant of the other sort of logics presented in the field of strategic management when we are talking about sort of key decisions in international business. So in that sense, are, are they distinct, these two, two fields? Well, 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 surely to some extent, there are many international business decisions that cannot be considered as strategic in any kind of way. And, and vice versa, many strategic decisions that have nothing international or global about them. But I think the bulk of the decisions that we study within international business, to some extent, draw on the logics of both strategic management and international business. And therefore, I think it is very sort of uh, apt and relevant to draw and then sort of embrace the logics coming from those two fields when developing our, our theory. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the other uh, panelists as well. Thank you very much, Marcus, for highlighting these complementarities. Uh, Xavier, I look forward to your thoughts. Well, thank you, Maka, and uh, thank you to uh, you and to the whole uh, uh, SDR leadership for uh, enabling this uh, this series, which I think is uh, is another. Uh, wonderful contribution to, to our community. All right, I should be sharing screen at this point. Let me just adjust a little bit and we are set to go. Um, I will um, um, make uh, a few points today. 
pertaining to what excuse has... me Xavier sure. oh, sorry to interrupt I oh, think you you're in the, the wrong uh, mode if you could yeah. go back to the uh, full yeah, screen absolutely. I appreciate it let me do that wonderful are you are we good now yes thank you yes yeah no problem all right uh thank you for uh, with apologies for this uh, for this uh, small I will make two major points today one pertaining to uh, from the perspective of a, of a strategy scholar, what can we learn, if anything, from uh, international business? Uh, I, I grant you that the opposite uh, discussion could be had and should be had, but perhaps in a different debate, and I'll return to it only as time allows. Um, I'll make two principal points today. One has to do with uh, the changing configuration of theories and how they have overlapped between the fields of strategy and international business over the years. The second having to do with our methodology and um, my point in that respect will be primarily how much um, overlap, but also how much synergistic, uh, I many synergistic opportunities still remain for cross-fertilization between our two fields. I won't talk extensively about specific research topic, but I will touch upon them in a broad sense. And indeed, let me start with that by making two general points about the field of, uh, of strategy, the field of international business, and um, uh, how they uh, may uh, be thought of in a synergistic way. The first point that I want to make is that from the perspective of what is broadly called international business, at least as identified in its major journals, uh, academic institutions and organizations and so forth. There are really two perspectives on, the, uh, what, on, on, on what happens when we want to study things that are taking place in two or more countries, nation states or locations. The first of those is the international, which we'll mostly be talking about today. But I don't want to underestimate the other one, which is the comparative dimension, which consists of all the insights that we can garner when looking at the same phenomenon with a precise lens in two different uh, locations. I want to emphasize that debate that, that particularly mentioned a whole lot more today, although we'll return to it at the end for good reason. But I want to mention simply that where this, where this be a session about, say, OB, IB distinctiveness, that second dimension would be so much more prevalent that it probably tells us that we should not be uh, ignorant of, uh, of this dimension in our, in our debate either. The second point I will make will be maybe a little bit more, maybe hopeful, maybe a bit less um, bounded than the point that Marcus just made by any definition of the scope, uh, topic area, or very much domain of strategy. I struggle to find a way in which the main topics that we study in international strategy are not strategic. Uh, in fact, uh, and so from my standpoint, I would be much more decisive than Marcus, partly because I think that this debate could be had in other contexts. There are other dimensions of the field of strategy or other uh, uh, domains of strategy where this debate could be had, uh, perhaps, but I would be very decisive about saying, if you study an international topic, obviously, just like not every acquisition is strategic, not every international investment, say, will be strategic, but by and large, the fit between the two domains, I think, is uh, unavoidable and compelling. With respect to theory, I'll touch on this briefly. Um, the point that I want to make is that I think this is an area where there has been uh, a, a deep uh, intertwining of theories in, our, in, in these two fields. And we can see this. The, what you're looking at here is a, uh, a multidimensional uh, scaling model of co-citation patterns between different theories in the field of uh, international strategy, essentially everything having to do with why, how, when, and with what consequences firms expand uh, across national borders. If we look at a critical period in that field, we see that just like the field of strategy um, and at an earlier period, there were really two sort of foundations 
to uh, the, that field of research. One essentially can be identified as uh, broadly speaking, uh, a, uh, an international uh, uh, economics or an economics uh, foundation, just at the same time that we were very much as a field of strategy uh, imbued with the ideas of Porter and, and, and others. Another, which is much more dis obviously strategy related centered around the resource-based view and the knowledge-based view, knowing though that the latter has as much of a claim uh, to being an international business generated theory as a, a strategy of a theory or a firm boundaries. In this universe though, we see that theories that may be a bit less obvious to pure strategy scholars are very prominent still. Internalization is actually the single linchpin of this entire uh, framework and other theories pertaining to internationalization, Jennings OS, so-called OLI framework are very prominent. Fast forward only 11 years and the field of IB, at least the field of international strategy adopted at its core, the theories of strategy uh, as we might uh, broadly understand them. It means a much emphasis on the resource-based view and institutional view, which I'll return to later, that is uh, also of some importance. And we can see that at that point, influences from other fields such as economics, uh, sociology, organization theory became more marginal to the field. So it's fair to say that in that period, the field of international business, at least the field, the subfield of international strategy, lost its distinctiveness and adopted the theoretical lenses of the field of strategy. Still, I would argue that that was another an important point in time, but that to this day, there remains quite a foundational uh, reason to believe, to, to, to argue that any strategy scholar should be interested and actively so in the contributions that uh, international management and international strategy can make. And that has to do with the role of institutions. Without sort of oversimplifying, it's fair to say that in the field of strategy, to the extent that there is a role for institution, it typically plays a role as a boundary on the behavior of firms, which is quite convenient conceptually. <laughs> Uh, which is quite convenient as regards the, um, in particular, some identification decisions, uh, the Michigan non-compete experiment uh, and other uh, examples uh, alike would abound. I would like to argue that in the field of strategy, uh, it, it can learn from uh, the way in which institutions have been from the onset, not only in, in an inherent source of variation within international uh, management and international business research, but a source of theoretical creativity. I've highlighted here on the left, uh, a wonderful paper by Tatiana Kostova uh, and co-authors, uh, which I will let you read, but that essentially makes the point that institutions and organizations should be thought of as an interplay. Um, that uh, uh, works out of time, that this also informs, according to Pang and his co-authors, uh, uh, our understanding of organization, therefore also the implementation of strategy. And uh, in a Humboldt paper that I uh, 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 provided later, that this might help us even rethink the very concept of competitive advantage. So I would argue that to the extent that we should be curious about the boundaries of strategy uh, from a theoretical point of view, the institutional lens that uh, is very prevalent in current contemporary strategy research for international topics or for international business research more broadly should be very compelling. Broadly speaking, I will finally, finally very quickly touch on four topics in methods that uh, again, should be, I believe, of interest to international scholars. The first of those has to do with the fact that international business is an excellent sandbox because it consists and offers to the decision maker, to the strategists, a complex set of decisions, but a finite set of decisions. These could be 
country choices of the type that Marcus and others have chosen uh, to, to examine. Um, this could be pertain to different modes of international expansion that firm may undertake. In each of those domains, uh, the uh, international business is uh, quite a fruitful source of inspiration for how we can model strategy choices in other domains. Sorry that my uh, mouse went backwards. The second point that I will make is that uh, inherent in international uh, dimensions, because international scholars naturally play with the decisions made by a firm, but also multiple countries in which those decisions are taking place. International uh, management scholars have arguably been more mindful of the multi-level dim dimensions of their research. And that too is a domain in which I would encourage uh, strategy scholars to uh, draw inspirations from uh, the field of international uh, strategy. In the area of uh, identification, I would say conversely that it's not obvious to me that international business scholars are necessarily at the forefront of advancing this. Uh, obviously, perhaps neither are strategy scholars, but there certainly has been tremendous progress in that area. Uh, the point that we will make in this reflect, though, is again, because the sandboxes that international business offers are very finite and very well understood, um, for to develop uh, both research ideas, but also to train PhD students, uh, IB topics are very prominent and prevalent. In fact, we see this, and this will be my last point, when it comes to um, the area of replication and research. I've highlighted here three papers that uh, have in recent years uh, brought uh, to our attention a second domain of where international strategy can really be and should be an inspiration to strategy research at large. And that has to do not with the choices that strategic decision makers made, but with the performance consequences of those choices. And here we see again that partly because of the well-defined uh, boundaries of the decisions and because of the relative maturity of the subject matter pertaining to how different multinational scopes of firms are related with different performance outcomes. Uh, we have seen um, very productive, but also very methodologically insightful uh, contributions uh, coming from the intersection of strategy and international business. As a very last point, I'll allow myself that this also means that international business is a field that comparatively speaking is ripe for replication. And I'll allow myself to say that not only obviously have the doors of say STR as a scholarly community, SMJ as a journal uh, and others, but that this has inspired uh, the uh, editors of a new journal, the Journal of Management Scientific Reports, among whom I happen to be, uh, to very much target this intersection of international strategy, of international and strategy um, as one of the domains where uh, we seek to encourage continued uh, effort at replication. With this, I will uh, stop and turn it over to you, Maka. Thank you very much for the insightful thoughts. Uh, in particular, one aspect that attracted my attention was when you were summarizing different theories. And in a parallel series in this SDR division, we were talking uh, about alternative theories that strategic management scholars use. The title of those series is Meet a Theory. And I think many of the topics, those intersections happen. So just wanted to put a plug in and encourage uh, the audience here, if they're interested uh, to delve into any of those topics, that resource is also available. Uh, Ram, we appreciate, I see your slides are already up there, so we're ready to go, thank you. Thank you, Mark. I thought I would uh, try, try and uh, move things along. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I think uh, completely by accident, uh, our presentations, at least thus far, seem to be fairly complementary with each other. Uh, Marcus has talked uh, about a very specific research context, uh, Xavier, as, as, as I expected, uh, took the uh, extreme, extreme uh, theoretical high ground 
Uh, I'm, I'm to some extent uh, the uh, the polar opposite of uh, Xavier in the sense that I'm I'm a very kind of real world kind of guy. So I'm going to basically talk uh, very much about uh, understanding the world we live in and how strategic management, international business, are basically complementary lenses through which we can understand how the the world we live in. Ultimately, that is our ultimate goal. I'm trained originally as an economist, uh, and so causality is something that uh, we were doing back in the 1980s. So uh, the whole idea of causality is very old, old stuff to me. Uh, and one, the only thing I'd say about that is uh, the for PhD students especially, bear in mind that causality is ultimately a matter of faith. It's impossible to prove causality no matter what you do. However, you can prove correlation. And uh, I, I would strongly encourage scholars to, uh, to, uh, to take, uh, to recognize the importance of correlation studies uh, and, and, but realize that what they're doing is correlation and not claim causation when they don't have it. And ultimately causation is something, ultimately you can only, you can get with a degree of probability. You can never prove that. It's impossible to prove, prove, prove causality. Okay, moving on uh, from that. My background, I teach international business, strategic management. As you saw, I'm a professor of strategy. My research is the nexus of, uh, I'm taking seriously what Maka told us to talk us about, uh, to talk about our background and our areas of interest. Uh, my research is the at the nexus of international business, economic geography and innovation. I have that research program uh, I call I Begin. I've been working on this now with, uh, with a number of other colleagues for the last 15 years or so. Uh, it's very policy relevant. It's a 21st century agenda. I'm a recent co-editor of the Global Strategy Journal, so strategic management and the perspective of the firm is a key aspect central to everything that I do. My quick outline of my, of my remarks over the next eight or nine minutes, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, I begin view of the world, the world we live in, uh, try to understand that. Uh, the key role of spatial transaction costs and connectivity, I'll define those. Uh, that will lead me to a little illustrative vignette about the Detroit automotive cluster uh, and firm strategy and finally, uh, IB, uh, that will lead me to my conclusion, which is basically that IB, again, to some extent, I think it resonates with what uh, both uh, Marcus and uh, uh, Xavier mentioned, which is IB as a means of strengthening the tools of STR. Okay, so the IB philosophy is ultimately the human connectivity, the web that underpins all civilization, the world we live in ultimately is entirely based upon divisional labor. Uh, that's what firms ultimately exploit. Uh, I think uh, the picture here, of course, as you can see, is Robinson Crusoe. Uh, if you, I, I think, uh, I would say for myself, I can't speak for you, but if I lived, if I was Robinson Crusoe and lived by myself with no ability to uh, to take advantage uh, of uh, uh, the skills of other people, uh, I would die. Uh, so this is the invisible and tangible web that basically connects uh, uh, all human development. Uh, and if we look at the connectivity across space, we see that it, the correlation, correlation, not causation, between that and world GDP per capita. So basically connectivity clearly is associated in some way with our increasing wealth that we have. So there are three research literatures here, national business, which is basically what we're trying to connect. Uh, in places like AIB and EBA and so on, we have the STR, the innovation, which is based well, typically under the STR, the AOM, SCR division, the TIM division, and ultimately economic geography. And I began ultimately trying to put together these three all together. I began this in 2005 uh, and a few things there. Journals, of course, they are, have to talk to each other. GIPS, which is international business, SMJ, GSJ, which sit over there, and finally the journal economic geography. And putting all these three literatures together, we've been able to publish for the last 15 years in multiple areas, ranging from SMJ uh, to HBR to, uh, to, to UN briefing papers. The world of yesterday ultimately was a world of trade and goods. So ultimately, the world of yesterday, the 20th century world to a large extent, uh, starting from the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, all the way to the middle of the 20th century, we lived in a world of high spatial transaction costs. What are these costs? Costs of doing business over geographic space, communication costs, coordination costs, shipping costs, insurance costs, and so on. This ensured that firm strategies, the strategies firm undertaken, undertook, were spatially bounded, right? They ultimately is limited for inter-firm competition, especially in terms of labor. So international business or inter-firm competition occurred to a large extent through finished goods. You made, made an entire car in Germany, you made an entire uh, uh, car in the US, and ultimately car companies in the US and car companies in Germany competed with each other uh, in terms of selling finished cars. So we had geographically disconnected local production systems, 
uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, that, that led to a world where since labor did not compete with each other, a bus driver and uh, if you you have the, the, the lucky uh, lucky sperm uh, uh, argument, or ultimately you know, uh, your standard of living determined was determined by how lucky you were in terms of where you were born. So if you're born in Munich, you made a lot of money. If you're born in Bangkok, you did not. Now we, of course, we know that the world spatial transaction costs have collapsed over the last uh, in the 21st century, and that means that this has led to firms, organizations harnessing and leveraging resources from places across space. So we go from local system to global systems, and this ultimately led to a world where low knowledge workers in advanced economies have seen collapsing living standards. Okay, so ultimately this is this is a very big reality. The world we live in is something that we as scholars and CEOs of big corporate corporations who are making strategy have to take this in mind because these populate these populist trends are not going away. So the future of global strategy, ultimately we in the 21st century, we will live in a world where conducting business over space is nearly costless. Innovation capabilities are critical, not production capabilities anymore. Ultimately, the value is based on customized knowledge based intangibles, not tangibles, and international business and international politics are inextricably linked. We lived in a world of the 20th century where the US and USSR did almost no business together. We live in a world of the 21st century where the strategy of the firm must take into account the fact that they are embedded in China and in the West simultaneously. So the classroom perspective, ultimately, uh, we have seen firms are mobile and flexible, locations are not mobile. And this means that pursuing commercial activity across national borders, pursuing the interests of their shareholders, Multinational firms, which ultimately, when I say multinational firms, bear in mind now that there are no firms, no firms, your local coffee shop, for example, included, which are not multinationals. Every firm makes use of global value chains in order to bring its value proposition to its consumer, even if it's a one person firm. So when they say firms, you must basically say multinational firms. And by pursuing the interests of their shareholders, they can harm the uh, internal locations where they do business. No, the, the quick vignette I had was Detroit between 1965 and 2010. The big three automakers transformed over this period from integrated manufacturers who ran local value chains to orchestrators of multinational global value chains. This, they, what this meant was they moved low skill, low knowledge activities to cost effective locations offshore and retained high knowledge activities in Detroit. So Detroit had become more central, not less central, to the innovation system, even as manufacturing collapsed. Uh, <clears throat> And this meant that we get, we get essentially this situation where Detroit population collapses. These are the Detroit co co auto, auto factories uh, in the 21st century. And ultimately we get a situation where high knowledge workers are seeing rising living standards. As you can see, the mechanical engineers, low, uh, low knowledge workers are seeing collapsing living standards. Okay, so we, this is ultimately the populism in the West that we're seeing is ultimately encapsulated in this single slide where we ultimately see within single location, high knowledge workers and low knowledge workers are seeing their interests diverge from each other and firms are pursuing the interest by leveraging those high knowledge workers. Okay, so ultimately the question is, is multinational strategy the problem or the solution? Right? Using international business, IB analysis can enhance the tools of strategic management. This is because IB incorporates local institutions. Very importantly, political geography. Uh, just this morning, actually, Short Bugelzeich sent me this paper by Siasta Korea et al., which just came out in JIBS in 2023, which ultimately reviews the notion of political geography. That if you are, for example, the CEO of a company based in Xavier's home country, a country where Xavier is at the moment, ASML, you really need to con consider political geography, right? Ultimately, your, your global connectedness, the strategies ASML pursue, ASML, I would argue, is the most important firm currently operating in the firm world since they make the, the, the machines that make chips. Uh, they need to recognize their international connectedness, local disconnectedness, and all the strategies that they make and recognize the politics of the world we live in. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was very thought provoking and I particularly appreciate that the different units of analysis here in strategy, we talk about firm level and this expansion that how many of these decisions can be strategic at different levels and in particular the complementarities even beyond STR and international business getting into the field of economics, geography, public policy, international affairs, there is just a lot and a lot that they can all learn from each other. So thank you, Susan, you're up.
Hey, you are on mute, Susan. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my slides okay now? Okay, thank you, uh, Martha, for coordinating. I definitely appreciate the invitation to be a part of this important uh, uh, dialogue. And my approach was slightly different, but definitely complementary to the other three speakers that you already heard, and that I tried to be as tactical as possible to really connect some examples of uh, this intersection of looking at the field of IB um, as well as strategy. And particularly, I sort of took on this primary question of um, how does IB research influence strategy? So for me, I was really trying to find the gaps of where the two overlap, but then things that um, uniquely, when we study them from an IB lens, that they actually have contributions to help us think about uh, primary strategy questions more robustly. So the three areas that I wanna um, focus on in this brief 12 minutes is corporate governance and ownership structure, organizational learning and knowledge transfer, and then um, global governance um, and leadership. And the three uh, key uh, sort of findings, if you will, that I'm gonna come back to um, is really one, thinking about understanding how context matters um, and understanding the institutional variation and context and how they vary globally helps us to think through how firms can be more uh, uh, successful in their strategic uh, decision-making. So for example, what are those implications on joint ventures, on m and deals, and how do you actually um, prevent um, unnecessary divestitures? Part of those answers um, lie in um, some of the learnings and insights that we have from an international perspective. Um, and then in terms of knowledge transfer, I think this is one of the things that we do really, really well uh, in the area of IB, right? Because we're constantly looking at how do firms actually transfer knowledge, not just from one plant location to the other, from one country to the other, and is that a successful operation or not? Um, and so I think there's a lot of implications here for org learning. Um, and then the last one is really looking at uh, uh, governance. But if we think about governance decisions, a lot of times they're localized at the firm level or how firms are... Uh, governance systems vary from competition, and I would like to argue and show at least one example of um, by look, having a global gaze on governance uh, might reveal um, key insights or key patterns that you can't necessarily see when you're examining how firms compete with one another or either uh, how industries evolve um, in a local economy. Okay, so I just want to give a couple examples here and particularly focusing on corporate governance and ownership structures and really asking this primary question of who owns and manages the firms. And I just give this example from the airlines industry. Um, but I do want to say is oftentimes in the strategy liter of literature alone, it's very US centric or very Western um, centric. So if we were to sort of take on a classical question from a strategy perspective and say who owns and governs these firms, these are obviously all US firms that compete in the airlines industry. But if you look at their corporate governance and ownership structures, they follow this logic that we assume most frequently of this Jensen and Mecklen that the widely that they're widely held standalone firms. And so there's separation between the principles in the agents and sort of this uh, assumption that we make most frequently in the strategy literature, um, oftentimes this logic is defied in the international context. So I want to show you a very similar industry and give you an example from Brazil um, and ask um, a slightly different question that is related to corporate governance and ownership structure, but really what motivates these family-owned firms. And this is um, tied to a paper that I'm currently working on at, with uh, Ed Zajac. Um, and if we were to say, okay, what is the largest airlines company in Brazil. It is actually Go Airlines for anyone who's gone to Brazil. You may have even flown on this airline. And then if we say, and um, who owns and manages firm, um, what you see is a very different depiction of governance uh, and ownership structure than you would see in the U.S. And that this is owned, this family was, this, excuse me, firm was founded and owned by the Castillo G. Oliveira uh, family group. Um, and it's currently um, both owned and governed by his four sons, that if you look just really quickly, you'll see that they take on both the executive as well as the board positions in terms of CEO, CFO, COO, um, and then they're all directors within the firms. And um, more interestingly, um, in this particular family structure, this is uh, the largest airlines in Brazil, um, there are other vested interested partners um, in that uh, some of the owners as well as governors are also institutional investors, much smaller percentages than we see in the US, and then politicians that come directly from uh, Congress, Senate, um, and the like. So I wanted to give this example because uh, it's really classic um, example and really thinking about those distinctions of corporate governance and ownership structure and how they vary around the world. And um, many papers um, in both the fields of strategy as well as IB acknowledge that the most common corporate governance ownership uh, structure around the world um, is the family firm, but important to understand, I uh, really like this data that was presented by Kathy Fogel in 2006, 
where she asked a very fundamental question that uh, says, if you look at the top of industry in these 41 countries that are represented here, <clears throat> excuse me, and then just say what percentage of those are family owned firms, what you see is great levels of variation and particularly some um, deviation for our, our assumptions that we make in the US um, and the UK and uh, other parts of the developed world. And that these are smaller percentages, roughly according to her estimates, uh, only about um, 16 to 19% uh, of the top of US uh, industries are uh, owned, owned by family firms. And that is very different than if we look across Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, uh, Mexico, and Peru, um, definitely upwards of 85 uh, all the way to 100% of the top of industry is family owned. So to no surprise, this family example that I just showed you um, in terms of Brazil is a very common practice um, in Latin America. So just moving forward with these assumptions, a couple of implications to consider is that in going outside of the US context or going outside of this Western context, we definitely wanna move our logics beyond just this principal agent dilemma to really thinking about in these contexts, the principal and agent are one and the same. So where we're gonna to tend to see these strategy issues and strategy um, puzzles that need to be resolved is how do you resolve those dilemmas <clears throat> that occur with the outside shareholders or in this case, potential um, joint venture partners. Um, so just um, uh, let me just sort of move here quickly because I think I brought too much information for 12 minutes, but I wanted to just um, sort of give a couple of implications of what this looks like from a research perspective. So um, in, in studying these in IB contexts that are outside of maybe more commonly known country environments or uh, are representative of regional patterns that we tend to see. My examples are gonna be mostly from Latin America. It helps us to be able to study research questions that are um, virtually almost impossible to study, right? In a US context or a UK uh, context. So in this Brazil context, because of the fact that the majority of publicly listed firms on the Boves Boss Stock Exchange are family owned firms, uh, we were able to create a more rich uh, typology of kind of some of the variation that exists in the in the family structures um, there, and then um, delve into uh, the Brazilian stock market as a representative example for what we would tend to find in other parts of uh, Latin America. And uh, just to quickly um, show um, how this connects and kind of some results and variation, if we look at these family-owned firm structures on the Bovespa Stock Exchange, um, what we can quickly see is also from a varieties of capitalism. There are multiple varieties of capitalism on the uh, Bovespa Stock Exchange, and only this latter category that I have highlighted here in red, the Novo Mercado, is actually very similar to the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ Stock Exchange, but the other parts of where the Boba Spa um, are dramatically different. Um, and just moving forward here, just wanted to quickly show these results, or excuse me, these descriptive insights as well. Then we think about our logics around family on firms. Oftentimes in the literature, if we think about just the strategy gaze, they're talked about as kind of family firms versus others. And using this IB approach to kind of find these areas of the world that have greater levels of heterogeneity and family structure we're able to see that there's much more variety and variation in types of family firms than probably we could have a, um, that understanding engaged from a US perspective. Um, and then just moving forward, just a couple of other uh, um, things to think about when we talk about corporate governance and ownership um, differences and how can we, what, what can I be lean on and provide to um, sort of strategy lens? Um, so going beyond the Bova Spa, I also did a study recently in um, 2019, this is actually a quick article in AIB Insights that actually just shows these generalized patterns throughout Latin America. So these are the five largest capital exchanges in Latin America. We've got the Caracas Exchange, uh, Sant in, I'm sorry, we got the uh, Chile Exchange in Santiago, uh, Santiago Chile, uh, the Mexican um, Mexico City Exchange. Uh, as well as Caracas and the Lima exchanges uh, in addition to the Boba Spa. And the primary um, consistency across these Latin American exchanges is that if you look at the number one shareholder, so um, this is a very different pattern than what we see with uh, widely held standalone firms, is that the number one shareholder across all of these change, exchanges on averages is the majority, uh, has majority stakes. And even if we deepen that pool, to just the top five largest shareholders, we can see that uh, not only are they majority, but somewhere hover between 70 to 80% of the overall outstanding share, uh, shares. So again, just um, another data point to kind of give us some things to think about in terms of the types of variation we can identify from an IB perspective that then helps us clarify and gain more depth um, in understanding from, uh, from 
a, a broader strategy perspective. Um, and then one last example, and really thinking about why this variation is important. So this is a study that I did a while ago with um, Bernie Young and uh, Randall Mork, where we looked at international joint venture patterns. And one thing that we consistently found, or what, what I would say is one of the contributions of this paper, um, is that if firms don't actually carefully think about these differences in corporate governance and ownership structure across countries, they literally can get into these patterns of international joint ventures that have a much higher likelihood of failure. So just really quickly, some descriptive um, data that we kind of teased apart, all of the different types of variations in corporate governance structures. I want you to focus on this sort of 11% uh, hazard. These are hazard rates, so you can read these as percentages. Um, the baseline of failure was 11%, and you can see some of these that had high levels of variation and their difference in corporate governance and ownership structure were the most likely to fail. And particularly I'm focusing on uh, this one type of structure that had 44% likely to fail. So, so um, okay, so moving forward, um, uh, I also wanted to um, just say a little bit more about organizational learning and knowledge transfer. And I think uh, Ron brought up, brought up a really important point in terms of thinking about uh, what types of firms are actually characterized as multinational and sort of where we're at in this whole, um, geopolitical context. Um, this question is incredibly important in understanding how our organization is actually learning. How is that now knowledge being transferred? And then what are the results of a firm that can actually survive today? Like how good are they actually at being um, agile relative to other firms? And uh, classically, if we think about this just from a strategy perspective or from an org learning perspective, um, some of the earlier work in this field, particularly by Linda Argodi, um, she has a fantastic book if you haven't read it, right? A assume that these, um, each of these firms has a particular learning curve and that firms come down on this learning curve as they have higher levels of repetition. And one of the contributions that we as a field of IB can add value tremendously to this type of logic is really thinking about how the context of learning matters. So my ASQ paper that looks at when does prior experience pay tried to peel apart this impact. So when we think about the trade-offs between global expansion versus local knowledge, and are you actually able to learn across um, different countries, what this paper actually accounts for are those institutional differences and whether they're similar or different. And a key finding, um, just sort of give like an example of firm A versus firm B is what this paper is trying to tease apart. So if you have a, a company, let's say like AT&T, where people think this is American incumbent firm, they should do well. They had gone to 19 different prior foreign countries versus America Mobile, one of their competitors in the industry that only gone to two. Which of these firms would you likely tend to think would succeed? And this paper gave great clarity to three distinctions, similar types of knowledge versus breadth and depth. And uh, what the results of this paper show is that similarity, yes, helps firms learn. We think about institutional context similarity. However, firms that have very dissimilar experiences relative to the subsequent investment are, are gonna pay a learning penalty that can be up to six, um, six fold um, the impact of those that had similar um, experience. Fine. So um, yeah, I was asking myself, what can I say after four speakers whose work I admire while fighting for jet lag? Um, so I, I think we'll go very old because I bet nobody will talk about Heimer. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is to just briefly talk about uh, my understanding of the evolution of the IB field and how it interacts. And I'm glad uh, Xavier mentioned the, the network, how it increasingly interact with uh, the, the strategy field. So the classic papers I read when I was a doctoral student in IB, right? It's really started with Vermin, Heimer, Tees, um, and talking about cross-country differences, cross-industry differences, um, and later firms start to get into the picture. It's like, hey, there's firm heterogeneity. Not everyone in Spain export the same thing, right? There's capabilities. There are all kinds of organizational differences. And then after that, and I think uh, what we read most in this field were two questions. One, why firms ever go abroad? And two, where they go, how they go, right? So um, the, the whole internalization uh, thought which dominate this part of the conversation was about transaction cost and why uh, firms as an organization, uh, as a hierarchy is better 
um, are better in overcoming the, the challenges in international transactions. And then we have um, RBV uh, leading to Koga and Zenger talk about how you know, firms are better in managing knowledge transfer and knowledge, and knowledge creation compared with the market, especially when it comes to tested uncodified knowledge. And of course, there's a property right um, theory saying, you know, those who possess the knowledge should be the residual claimant, which explains the existence of multinational companies. So there's a big literature about why firms ever go abroad. And then there's how to they go abroad, right? I remember this interesting debate between Miles and others about do we need more study on entry mode, but entry mode is a distinct field uh, in IB uh, study in the the strategic decisions companies make, right? When when they um, have their unique capabilities and uh, looking at a very different world. So um, I think when it met strategy, uh, how I see, again, I emphasize this is how I see it and the names mentioned on there, there are not the representative ones, they're just the first ones came to my mind. Um, so, when IB met strategy, uh, the first part was uh, increasing emphasis on firm heterogeneity, right? You, we no longer have the old field in which, oh, you know, multinational companies have unique technology, that's why they go abroad. You know, what kind of technology, how they manage it, and so increasing emphasis on the, uh, the differences across firms and increasing emphasis on the environment. Um, Institution again being a big part of it, and non market strategies start to show up uh, in uh, in this field. Is saying, well, it's not only about going abroad, right? When we talk about entry mode, it's not only about just going to a different country. What kind of country? What kind of institutional feature is there? Um, so uh, these become interesting variations. And I think the field really uh, is enriched by, has been uh, enriched by um, the development in the strategy field. You know, the emphasis on the match between internal organization and external uh, environment, um, the whole strategy and structure field, right, strategy, uh, strategy network. So all the, the development in these fields are making the questions in IB a lot richer and more interesting. Um, again, like from how firms organize contingent on the environment, uh, how, you know, multinationals, that's a network, or how we arbitrage across field. And I think, you know, the, the richer, more specific questions are in, um, benefit, benefited from the development in the strategy field. So I thought, you know, I just spent two minutes, maybe three, uh, quickly talking about how the earlier days of IB, you know, talking about firms export and going abroad because somehow they have superior te technology to a more nuanced understanding of um, firm heterogeneity and environment heterogeneity. So um, in the remaining few uh, minutes, I just want to, uh, since we're talking about the dialogue of distinctiveness, right? What's unique about IB? And um, I'll talk about three points very quickly. One is just the context. And I think it's already reflected in many of the earlier speakers. Um, the international field, I'm biased, obviously, because I just find the, the context richer, more interesting. And uh, um, from, you know, labor practice, cultural differences to institutional differences, uh, it, it, context-wise, um, it's unique. And there are also unique concepts, right? So, you know, for example, Katie's work on the property rights within firms. You know, Williamson said, no, there's no property rights within firms because the parent can always decide what the subsidiaries do. Um, 
property rights belongs to the firm and the market transaction happens between firms. You don't have contracts within the firm. And Katie said, well, wait a minute. If these two subsidiaries are cross countries, then they're subject to different rules and regulations and the governments will step in. And you know, I have personal experience in Shanghai Auto and the Shanghai government will come in when VW want to change the, the IP ownership of the outcome, right? So, so the moment you have a multinational company where subsidiaries are residing in different countries, subjecting to different rules, and all of a sudden subsidiaries can write contracts, not only that, they're enforceable. So um, some unique concepts and I think uh, is on, uh, are only available in the, the IB context. Um, call it global or, or IB. And, and finally, um, the same idea will have different implications once you go beyond the country boundary. So for example, you know, some of you know, I'm obsessed with patent litigation these days. And uh, um, if you look at the domestic foreign shopping, there's a literature about how companies look for most friendly um, patent court, right? Because if you go to a friendly court and get a positive uh, vote on your patent, you can carry it around the whole United States of America. And of course, it's a no brainer. You know, you, you go to the most patentee friendly court for the decision. Um, well, not so much in global foreign shopping, right? The moment you get out of the country, the enforcement is only within the jurisdiction where the decision is made, right? You can go to a friendly court and get a nice outcome. So what? No other country will enforce it. And to make things worse, if you get a positive outcome from a friendly court, your opponent think it's less likely to be replicated in other countries. So it's less convincing. Your wing in a friendly court is less convincing to your global competitors that you can replicate your success in other courts. As a result, you have to fight again and again and again, and you're less likely to seal a deal if you um, look for a friendly court. So the fact that in the domestic setting, you have a no-brainer decision of going to a friendly court, and the opposite is true, in an international setting make, again, the, the, I think the IB setting, um, having something to offer to the strategy field, right? So I know we don't have a lot of time. I just want to emphasize the, the different concept, the different context and the different implication, even if we're talking about the same phenomena, uh, location choice in patent litigation. So um, I will end here and looking forward to comments or questions. Thank you very much, Minyuan, for uh, keeping moment the momentum and continuing the conversation. I appreciate your thoughts. So uh, if we could, uh, possible, I know like each of you uh, have kindly and generously shared your thoughts and perspectives about this topic. And uh, now that you have heard uh, the perspective of the other panelists, uh, if you would like to share a few reflections, uh, we can start again with Marcus, Xavier, uh, from uh, Susan and Mignon, and then we'll open the floor to uh, questions from the audience. And in the meanwhile, I, I encourage uh, a remaining audience to post their questions in the chat or be ready to raise their hands so that they can unmute and hear their thoughts. Uh, Marcus, any reflections from you? Yeah, so so thank you uh, to uh, I guess to to all the co co panelists and I, I uh, this sort of one one thing that that strikes me listening to uh, both Xavier, Martin, Susan, and Minyang, and 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 that is namely this 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 uh, uh, statement that that no strategy is an island, right? So 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 this is also very much uh, the same message that that uh, Ram talks about when he talks about the Robinson Crusoe economy. So, so, so clearly no strategy is an island, right? So, so I think Xavier makes a very compelling argument saying that, well, not only most, but all IB topics are strategic, right? So, so you know, we're really pushing uh, a controversial issue here. Ram says that IB and strategic management are, are necessary mechanisms to understand the global economy. 
Susan really makes compelling argument of saying that context matters, right? So for issues such as corporate governance, as well as for learning, I mean, Young has a very nice view of saying that, that, that while the two fields really emerge at the point where we can use the logics to understand issues such as arbitrage, such as litigation shopping, and so forth, right? So, so in this sense, that, that no strategy is an island. I mean, in, in contrast to, I guess, what I said, where I'm saying that, that the IB topics that we study inevitably draw on strategic management logics. I think the other way also sort of becomes quite clear when listening to the other presenters here, namely that, that IB definitely has something to offer to the whole strategic management literature, right? So, so in the sense that we acknowledge that, that firms operate in a connected way, be it a domestic firm or be it a global firms, they are somehow connected by some kind of mean, means that we should take these context these connectivities seriously and then really start to theorize upon how we may understand what the boundaries of our understanding of the theories of strategy management are so 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 on that note i i i guess i'm somewhat optimistic as well being an ip scholar that that we do have something to offer for the broader field of strategic management so i'll i'll stop there please Thank you very much. Or uh, maybe we can uh, continue with Susan, uh, if uh, that's okay, or Susan, with you, and then we'll come back to uh, that year. Uh, thank you for giving me the moment. I'm still a little bit uh, in shock, so forgive me for being a little uh, uh, disjointed here. But um, um, one of the observations that I did want to make, and I'm really glad that this uh, session was sponsored by the strategy division of AOM, um, is really thinking about um, how IB is connected. Um, forces us to go to sort of the core of the strategy questions that we ask as a field. And um, in doing so, um, I really see IB as like a direct complement to our understanding of answering all of those foundational questions. So part of the reason why I actually selected and where I see um, the same overlap in some of the other speakers is like identifying what are those areas that potentially are blind spots within the field of strategy and then using the IB context to sort of help enrich in our environment. Um, and so I got really excited about Minwan's passion and really thinking about um, the questions that are related to intellectual property, right? Because when you can think about not just the litigation and what lit 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 litigation um, outcomes would mean for firm strategy, but in seeing how that varies across different global contexts can enrich in um, sort of understanding of that particular question. Um, so I just wanted to, um, sort of highlight that for each of the speakers is I think we each touched on an area that is a strength in the IB literature and then how it can help deepen our understanding of the broader strategy questions that we're asking. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Xavier. <clears throat> Thank you, Maka. Uh, well, I guess I was, I was really uh, like uh, already uh, Marcus and, and Susan said, uh, struck by uh, I think the fact that there there is a core of agreement on the phenomenological dimensions of what we're talking about, which, which I think is, is compelling. Another way that I would perhaps uh, summarize what I heard is that uh, IB, the IB context blesses us with more variance, uh, perhaps than sometimes we know how to do uh, or what to make uh, uh, with. Um, that variance may be a spatial, Ram, for example, alluded to that. It may be uh, of the governance and institutional dimension that Susan in particular touched upon. Um, it may be uh, more um, uh, in the area of values and perceptions, which I, I suspect was one of the mechanisms that Marcus's uh, wonderful paper was, was touching upon. Um, and it ends up basically uh, hitting a boundary which has to do with national sovereignty, which uh, Minwan touched upon uh, in a very, uh, in a very uh, uh, compelling way, which uh, leaves us a bit of an end. There is no world government. Uh, there will be even less of a world government uh, plausibly in uh, future years than there has been at uh, a peak when we might have thought of globalization as a, as a as an end state or at least as a success, a success story. Um, so all this variation uh, is really what I would encourage scholars in strategy to uh, tap into uh, where it serves them. On the other hand, there we had we do have a few blind spots which I 
trust advances in other subdomains of strategy will, uh, will could help us with. One of them that I we haven't sort of touched upon very explicitly, but I think was implicit underneath a lot of the ideas that we heard is that we sometimes don't have a very good grasp on the motivation of firms for international expansion. That, that motivation was understood. It was logical and simple at the onset of the field as uh, Minwan in particular touched upon it. And then we've had an explosion of ideas about what could motivate firms to shift their boundaries, operate internationally in different locations, in different ways, for different time frames, with different uh, goals in mind. And we still to this day do not have a very good handle, I believe, at least on an empirical basis, uh, or at least especially on an empirical basis, on what this mix of motivations that firms may have uh, could be. I still believe that international context can give us some solid answers to this, uh, provided we uh, dig into the institutional conditions that I alluded to um, earlier, together with obviously the firm specific conditions that strategy scholars excel at teasing out. But I believe that uh, strategy scholars can and should uh, also inform this debate in a, in a very uh, uh, central way. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Brown, please. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to, uh, 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 I think, uh, be begin by recognizing, uh, especially since we're talking about uh, the the theory and uh, uh, building very much on uh, Mignon's uh, lovely slide in terms of looking back and history in the beginning and how we got together, uh, to recognize if we that ultimately, uh, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, there's no such thing as strategic management theory. There's no such thing as rational business theory because these are all derivative fields. Uh, and they're anchored in uh, fundamental social sciences, economics, sociology, political science, and so on. And so if we say, for example, transaction cost economics, well, it comes from economics. It's not strategic management. Uh, if we say institutional theory, I mean, okay, it comes from sociology, perhaps, and so on. So ultimately, there are these fundal, fundamental underlying disciplines for where the theory comes from. And we are ultimately applying these theories in particular particular contexts. Okay, so now we take these theories and we say, well, let's look at the business firm, the Joy Star Company, or as Susan pointed out, the family firm. Okay, there are different kinds of firms, and these theories then, which come from foundational disciplines, apply differently in the different different uh, different contexts. Uh, and international business, of course, is taking a, a very specific context, the international context. So in that sense, when we talk about strategic management, we're in the SDR division. So strategic management is defined as the management of an organization's resources to achieve its goals and objectives. To that extent, it is wider than international business, because international business focusing on any commercial activity or transaction between companies, organizations, individuals, or governments that crosses borders, right? So ultimately, we're talking about crosses borders, which is a requisite for to, to become international. And if it doesn't cross borders, then it's still strategic. That said. So strategic management to some sense is wider than international business. But international business is in also some sense wider than strategic management because international business, of course, incorporates not only the firm, but also international transactions. So international trade is part of international international business. We talk about international business, we can talk about core company country uh, comparative advantage. Uh, we can talk about the idea of locations that ultimately the whole unit of analysis of international business is the nation state which is of course, to that extent, wider than the business firm per se. So there's an overlap between the two where, where, these, where these two contexts overlap. And that's what we're talking about here. And this, in our, our, our discussion today, we're talking about contextual overlap where we would apply tools which come from fundamental social sciences. And they had they, these tools take on different colors, different forms, when they're applied in different contexts, right? So when you apply strategic management in some context, it looks different than we apply in other contexts. So other than that, I'll stop here. Thank you, Minyang, please. Well, I'm glad um, I followed around because I think he just answered the question I'm going to pose to everyone. So this this is a comment as well as a question. I don't know about you, but I got this question a lot. Are you IB or global strategy? Right? Are you strategy or IB? And uh, 
and I'm glad that if I understand the comments from this group correctly, there's really no distinction. I don't have to answer this question next time I was asked, um, because uh, Ram, even to your point about export, I think export is a strategic decision too. And as long as we're talking about a firm organization or some decision-making body, right? It doesn't have to be firm. Um, as long as we think about interactions, um, it's it's strategic. So to me, IB is more about the context, the phenomena that excite all of us and uh, um, the approaches, as you rightly point out, the approaches, the theories come from distinct social science uh, disciplines. So, um, so I, I think this, if anything, I'm, I'm glad to get some confirmation from my understanding of the relationship between IB and uh, all the other disciplines. And I think uh, the um, enrichment uh, IB as a phenomena God from uh, those theoretical foundations are just very promising. And um, I have to say, as someone who teach an IB PhD seminar, the papers these days are a lot more interesting than 20, 30 years ago um, because of the interaction, because of all the enrichment from the discipline. So um, I'll stop here. Thank you. This was a very nice note to end uh, with uh, directions for doctoral students and what you uh, encourage them to check as well as mm -hmm. this appreciation of how the two fields have moved and advanced each other is in creative complementarity. Uh, we have very few minutes left for questions. I'm wondering if anybody from the audience uh, would like to raise their hands, ask a question, or uh, enter it in the chat for us to follow up or otherwise. Uh, we can end the session. I don't see anything in the chat yet. Very good. So I don't see anything. Uh, Michael, uh, any thoughts, any questions from you? I know some of the presentations are already referring to your own work on this area. I won't comment on that. I will comment on two things. Uh, this is, so thank you, first three things, I guess. So thank you all. Thank you, Maka, for handling this with such a plum. And thank you for all for your comments. Um, I, it, it is, this is part of a slightly larger initiative uh, that we will ha have a, sort of culminate with the STR plenary uh, session where we'll be talking about eight or nine of these distinctiveness sessions where, which we've, uh, Maka has actually been instrumental in several of them, but we've, we've run several of these sessions where we're talking about what is uh, similar and dissimilar across areas. I think, Ram, your comments uh, you know, we have I have a slide that I'm looking at on my screen right now, where we have base disciplines and then fields in a matrix, and I think everybody here will be very sympathetic to that, and then helping us think about what is distinct and different across those, the assumptions and the disciplines, and then the application of those disciplinary theories across the fields, and and so sort of the, the provocative statement I'll make to some of you, I, I, Xavier, my dear friend, I hope you don't hate me after this. But you know, I think Rom's comment would highlight something like international accounting is probably not part of international strategy, right? But there is, but there is something different about, and but an, an accountant, you know, could be thinking about uh, and taking economic perspective as several of my scholar, accounting colleagues do. Um, so I, I, I guess I'll just thank you all. Before rambling, thank you all. Uh, I really love that the way this ended with uh, the matrix idea. I think that's getting clear and precise about when we're applying theories and testing them and understanding the distinctions between contexts and the different questions in fields is important, as well as making the distinction between fields and disciplines. And then, you know, uh, the third comment, part of a broader discussion, if you found this interesting, I think you'd find some of the other discussions we've been having and maybe the STR plenary interesting. So uh, thank you all. And I'll just sign off there. Thank you very much. So with this, I uh, will end the session. Appreciate all of you joining for our today's session. And I encourage you to check the video of our other presentations, or if you want to revisit uh, our earlier discussion here for this video. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the time. Look forward to seeing you at AOM pretty soon.